Hello and welcome to this, the third of our studies in the Westminster Confession of Faith. We're going to be looking at chapter 1, verses 6 through to 10. Before we do that though, how did you go on with the questions I sent you last week? We began by asking about Psalm 19. What do verses 1 to 4 tell us about God? Well, let's just read those verses together. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. What do these four verses tell us about God? Well, most fundamentally, they tell us that God exists. They tell us that he is glorious, that he is the creator, and that he can be discerned through creation. Creation speaks to us, proclaims to us that there is a God. However, halfway through the psalm, the, the psalmist changes direction and the question is, in verses 7 to 11, what do they tell us about God's law, about the written word of God? Well, again, let's just read some of these verses. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making the wise, making wise as simple. The precepts of the Lord are right giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes, and so forth. Well, really the psalmist is telling us here that creation itself is not enough for us to know God. We need his word. The law is perfect, not imperfect or limited. It can be trusted. And, and therefore God's law, God's word, gives us joy, it brings us knowledge and wisdom, it teaches us righteousness. Next, I ask you to read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, and ask these questions. First of all, what precisely has incurred God's wrath, according to verses 18 and 19? Well, the answer to that is, the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. That is the truth of the existence of a creator God. Interestingly, the word there, suppressed, uh, the image there is of um, telling a dog, as it were, to sit down, uh, to behave, to, to be quiet. That's what we've done with our, our knowledge, with our consciences. Um, that we, we have deliberately suppressed, we've told uh, this, this idea of the knowledge of God in us to, to be quiet. We don't want to hear it. And then the next question is, according to verse 20, what qualities of God are clearly seen? Uh, well, the qualities of God that are clearly seen, uh, according to Romans, uh, his eternal power and divine nature. That is his power displayed in creation. And I was asking if you could give any examples of these qualities of God. Let's go on to the third question. We need the Bible to explain the way of salvation. What do these scriptures tell us about the way of salvation? John chapter 14 verse 6. That's where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That verse teaches us that we need Jesus in order to come to God and to receive his forgiveness. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 is very similar. Uh, there is no other name under heaven given by which we may be saved. That is the name of Jesus. Jesus is essential for forgiveness of sins. And then in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 to 13, there the Apostle Paul tells us that if we believe that Jesus is Lord and was raised from the dead, we shall be saved. 
So, we shall be saved. So then we see that at the very heart of salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ, the necessity of believing in him and his work on the cross. Now, uh, question four, um, I, uh, I wrote this. With regard to committing God's revelation of himself to writing, you may be interested to read Deuteronomy 31, verses 24 to 29, Jeremiah 36, verses 1 to 7, and Luke chapter 1, verse 4, all of which talk about uh, writing down what, um, what God has said, uh, or, or Luke in particular writing down what he had discovered in his research about the Lord Jesus. Uh, I'm asking you, reflect on how these passages meet the confession's reasoning that the writing down of God's revelation was for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and the world. So I hope that you did some thinking and reflecting about that. Let's move on then to number five. How do the following passages demonstrate that the Bible claims to be the word of God? Well, first of all, in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10 to 20, and that really is just a representative example of what the prophet said. Hear the word of the Lord, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken, prophet after prophet, thus saith the Lord. They didn't stand up and say, here's what I think they claimed to be speaking God's word. Interestingly, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 11, where the author of Hebrews is quoting from Psalm 95, but he begins his quotation as the Holy Spirit says. So the writer of Hebrews recognised that it wasn't just the psalmist who was the author, but the Holy Spirit. And then two very, very important verses uh, in this regard uh, from 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, where it tells us that all scripture is God breathed, that is God breathed out. And, and 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And the word there for carried along, um, it's, it's the kind of idea of, of a ship or a boat uh, being at the mercy of the waves, uh, in that the sailors are not in control of where the boat goes. And uh, so they're carried along. They just have to go where the wind and the waves take them. Likewise, those who spoke from God, the prophets of old, uh, they weren't in control of what they said in, a, in, in that sense. Uh, they had to say what they were given. Okay, let's move on now to question six. What do the following passages demonstrate about the attitude of the apostles to what they preached and taught? And first of all, I'll take you to Acts chapter 15. That's the, the council in Jerusalem dealing with the question about whether or not Gentiles could be included in the people of God without converting, first of all, to Judaism. And uh, in Acts chapter 15, verse 28, this, the, they say this very interesting thing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Now, that really sounds awfully arrogant to the Holy Spirit and to us, placing their own opinion on the same level as the Holy Spirit. But we know these men. We know these men from the pages of Scripture. They're not arrogant men at all. Uh, most of them gave their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so they are speaking with with authority there, that they regarded their own teaching as on the same level as the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that inspired Psalms, the Psalms to be written, for example. And then moving on uh, to 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, where the Apostle Paul commends the Thessalonians for the way they received his message, his preaching. He says, you received it not as a word of men, but as it is the word of God. Paul believed that when he preached the gospel, he was speaking the word of God. This was not just his opinion. It had been revealed to him. 
Okay, let's move on now to number 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16, how does the Apostle Paul explain why some people have spiritual understanding and others don't? Well, the answer to that is that people who do not understand and uh, uh, people who will not accept the gospel, ultimately the reason is they lack the Holy Spirit in their lives. If Paul says, God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. Now, last of all, uh, there was this uh, little digression from the Second Helvetic Confession. Let me read uh, to you from it and then we'll, we'll think about it. When this word of God is now preached in the church by preachers lawfully called, we believe that the very word of God is proclaimed and received by the faithful and that neither any word of God is to be invented nor is it to be expected from heaven and that now the word itself which is preached is to be regarded not the minister that preaches for even if he be evil and a sinner nevertheless the word of God remains still true and good. Now the second Helvetic confession uh, from the Swiss uh, was, was written in the middle of the 1500s and was the first of the reformed confessions to be universally accepted. Uh, the background to this particular statement is that in the early stages of the Reformation, some people got it into their heads that anybody could be a preacher. Now, in reformed churches like our own, we believe that preaching is a spiritual gift that has to be tested by the church before somebody is unleashed upon a congregation. So that's why it talks about preachers lawfully called. So this is a statement that underlines our high view of preaching, unlike some other churches which perhaps eh, are more focused on the sacraments. When a preacher lawfully called by the church preaches, he is preaching the word of God. The assumption, of course, is that being lawfully called, he will have passed all the tests of orthodoxy. Uh, now, of course, there are all sorts of reasons why a congregation might close its ears to sound preaching, including not actually liking the minister, uh, or, of course, discovering that uh, he has committed some, um, some heinous sin. But that should not, that does not give them permission to reject the sound preaching of the Bible. And it is, of course, a very sobering thought that a sinful hypocrite can actually preach well, but his sin does not nullify the truth of the gospel. We're ready now to move on to the remainder of chapter 1. And... I should say that if I do look a wee bit different, eh, it's because we've had to do a wee bit of editing and there are actually 24 hours between eh, what you've just seen looking at the questions and what we're about to see now. Eh, in other words, there's eh, another day's growth on the face, but I hope that doesn't put you off. Well, let's just move on then. Now, if sections 1 to 5 teaches about the necessity of scripture and the origin of scripture, then the remaining sections teach us about the sufficiency and the clarity of scripture. Section 6 begins, The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith and life, is either expressly set down in scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from scripture. This is an affirmation of the sufficiency of Scripture. All we need to know as to how to bring glory to God, all we need to know about salvation, all we need to know about the life of faith 
is either expressly set down in Scripture or by common sense can be deduced from Scripture. So what is clearly expressed? Well, it's clear that the Bible teaches that God is the creator. It's quite clear that humanity has incurred the wrath of our creator God by our rebellion against him. It is made quite clear that our only hope of escaping God's fully justified anger is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who absorbed that anger by dying in our place at Calvary. And the Bible also makes it perfectly clear how those who have faith in the Lord Jesus are to live. However, there are some aspects of the Christian life that are not clearly set out as, as commands, but which can be deduced. Um, for example, just by looking at the lives of holy men and women uh, in the Bible. Uh, now, let's just take one example, corporate prayer. Uh, we have a, a prayer meeting, we believe in praying together. Now, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us not to make a show of our prayers like the hypocrites in his day, but says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And some have taken that to mean that we should only ever pray in private and never in public. But that wasn't the practice of the apostles, was it? It's several times in the book of Acts uh, we read of the church coming together to pray. Uh, for example, when Peter was in prison, praying for his release. Now, are we going to say that the apostles were disobeying the Lord Jesus? Of course we're not going to say that. The contexts are different. We deduce then that it is right and proper for Christians to come together to pray as long as we avoid trying to impress others with our eloquence and our false piety. And it may well be that you can think of some other examples of uh, the Christian life which are not expressly stated in Scripture, uh, but uh, are in line with the spirit of the Bible. Section 6 continues. Unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nothing is to be added to what the Bible teaches. Now, the most crass examples of this is where you get the cults, uh, like the Mormons, claiming that their own so-called scriptures are equal to the Bible. Uh, I don't think we're going to be fooled by that. Uh, and uh, we think about what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians in Galatians 1 verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Now, what we need to be on the lookout for are claims from within the recognised church of some new truth some new revelation that has been revealed by the Holy Spirit. It might come from a preacher, it might come from a self-proclaimed prophet, it might even be from a general assembly. Our guiding principle is this, if it's new, it's not true, and if it's true, it's not new. It really, it is of the utmost arrogance to, to claim to have received a new revelation from God, as if our Father in heaven would have left his church ignorant of this vital knowledge for the last 2,000 years. Now, having said that, sometimes when we are reading the Bible, we see something for the first time, something that we hadn't noticed before. Friends, that is not a revelation, that is an insight. An insight. Now, uh, if you uh, listen to the sermon from uh, Revelation on the 3rd of May, uh, I mentioned a new insight that I had received, um, which was this sense in which all scripture is apocalyptic, taking the literal meaning of apocalyptic, meaning to reveal, uh, that all scripture reveals something of God. And, and therefore, in that sense, all scripture is apocalyptic. 
And I, I really just, it was the first time that that had dawned on me. Um, and I think it's also true to say that there have been times when the church at large has neglected certain biblical truths. Uh, the 20th century saw a resurgence in interest in the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Now, that wasn't a new revelation from God. It was the church rediscovering something that she had neglected. Well, the authors of the Confession had not forgotten the Holy Spirit. They recognised our need of the Holy Spirit in understanding the Bible. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word. Why do we need the Holy Spirit to help us to understand? Not because the Bible is completely obscure, it's because we are sinful. We are sinful. Um, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, perhaps you've had the experience of trying to explain the gospel to someone uh, and doing so as simply as you can, and they just don't get it, or they dismiss it as total nonsense. Now, that is not because you haven't explained it well. They have not received the light of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's why before I preach, I always pray to the Holy Spirit, uh, because I am under no illusions that it's my preaching that is going to change people's lives. Only God's Holy Spirit can do that. Section 6 ends by acknowledging that there are some circumstances concerning the Word of God and government of the Church common to human actions and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the Word which are always to be observed. So, the Bible tells us that we are to meet together. We are not to forsake meeting together. But the Bible doesn't tell us which day to meet on or at what time. Now, the church has deduced from the New Testament that we ought to meet on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, the Day of Resurrection. What about the time, though? Well, in Scotland, the most common time is 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. And, and, and do you know why that is? Well, it was to give the farmers time to, to milk their cows. So, at one time anyway, uh, that was put into practice Christian prudence. Nowadays, it's just a tradition. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the Apostle Paul sets out some principles for how worship is to be conducted. Now, these were the very earliest days of the church, and the New Testament had not yet been written, uh, so they were still depending on revelations from God to guide them. So Paul talks about prophecy and speaking in tongues and the interpretation of those tongues. Now, we believe that these kind of revelations and prophecies are no longer relevant because the Bible is complete. But we do still follow Paul's instructions that everything should be done decently and in order. We do not believe in a free-for-all in our worship services. We have a minister who is called by God and called by the congregation. His job is to lead the worship and to preach, and we believe that he will do so prayerfully and in the Spirit of God. Well, let's move on now to section 7. Let me read it to you. All things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed and observed in sal for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of Scripture or other that not only the learned, but the unlearned in due use of the ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. All things in Scripture 
are not alike plain in themselves. Well, I don't think anybody's going to argue with that, especially those of us that are going through Revelation at the moment. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16 always brings a smile to my face. Uh, Peter is writing about Paul's letters and he says, His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. But here's the thing, my friends. The important things are clear. The important things are clear. Uh, I think it was Mark Twain who said that it wasn't the things in the Bible that he didn't understand that bothered him. It was the things that he did understand that bothered him. It's plain. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's plenty in the Bible that is easy to understand just by reading it in the ordinary way. And as for those parts that are a bit more difficult, that need more work, well, that's why one of the gifts of the Spirit is, is teaching. Um, the, the, the ability to teach the Bible. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. It was he, that is Christ, it was he, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, so that the body of Christ may be built up. Those of us who are called to be pastors and teachers are to be given the time to do the hard work so that we can present the Bible's teaching to you, the congregation, in a way that you can understand. Section 8 assures us that we can be confident that the Bible we read accurately reflects what was originally written down. Of course, we do not have the original manuscripts, but we do know that the Jews were meticulous in copying the Old Testament, and we have a huge number of ancient copies of the New Testament, far more than any other ancient document, which we can compare with each other to ensure the accuracy of the transmission from the original manuscripts to the, uh, from the earliest days. Now, you know fine well that the original languages of the Bible were Hebrew and Greek. There's also a smattering of Aramaic in the Old Testament. Uh, and, and therefore, we expect our biblical scholars to be familiar with these languages. And we also hope that our ministers have at least a working knowledge of, of these languages, Hebrew and Greek. And it's at this point that the Confession says something very interesting that I'd never noticed before. <clears throat> but because these original tongues, Hebrew and Greek, are not known to all the people of God, who have a right unto and interest in the Scriptures, and are commanded in the fear of God to read and search them, Therefore they are to be translated into the vulgar tongue of every nation unto which they come, that the word of God dwelling plentifully in all, they may worship him in an acceptable manner, and through patience and comfort of the scriptures may have hope. Well, friends, here we have our mandate for Bible translation work, something that we in Hope Church are rather interested in. Uh, the Confession actually says that the people of God have our right to have the scriptures in their mother tongue. That is the vulgar language of every nation in their own mother tongue. Now, that of course was a swipe at the Roman Catholic Church of the day, which for a long time refused to allow the Bible to be translated into the uh, European languages um, because their view was that ordinary people could not be trusted with the Bible. But as the Confession says, it is by being able to read the Bible for ourselves that we learn to worship God in an acceptable manner and obtain hope. You know, you know, we are very, very blessed to have had the Bible in English for nigh on 500 years. So along with the rights and the blessings there comes a responsibility. We have a responsibility to read the Bible, to study it, and to follow its teaching. We need to follow the example of the Bereans. We read about them in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, 
who we are told examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. If we don't, we are in danger of receiving the Lord's rebuke. As he says in Matthew 22 verse 29, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. That was section 8. Now we move on to section 9 and it teaches us that the infallible rule of interpretation of scripture is scripture itself. In other words, if we find one particular passage of the Bible difficult to understand, the best way to understand it is to look at another clearer passage that's on the same subject. So let me just give you an, an example here uh, where we could go wrong. Mark chapter 10 verse 17, that's where the young man approaches Jesus and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replies, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, if we were to take what Jesus says at face value, it sounds as if he is saying, don't call me good. Only God is good. And I'm not God. And I have actually heard a Muslim use that text to prove that Jesus did not claim to be divine. But here's the problem. That would be to contradict so many other texts where it is crystal clear that Jesus does indeed claim to be divine. Especially, especially throughout John's Gospel, John chapter 10 verse 30, for example, I and the Father are one. So does the Bible contradict itself? No, it does not. Read on, and in the story, it becomes clear that Jesus is challenging this young man as to his attitude towards him. This man has asked Jesus about inheriting eternal life, but when Jesus tells him, he walks away. He had ascribed a divine attribute to Jesus, being good, like God, but he did not accept Jesus' word as the word of God. It's because we know the New Testament that it teaches that Jesus is divine, is God. That way we avoid the mistake of interpreting Mark chapter 10 verse 18 as Jesus denying his divinity. I hope you, I hope, I hope you see what I'm, what I'm trying to say there. The infallible interpretation of scripture is scripture itself. Okay, finally section 10. And section 10 rounds off chapter 1 by affirming that the final word on any matters of the faith lies with the Holy Spirit speaking in the scriptures. The supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined and all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men and private spirits are to be examined and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other than the Holy Spirit speaking in the scripture. Now that last phrase about the Spirit speaking in the scripture is really important. There has been a tendency in theologically radical circles to claim that it is the Holy Spirit who is leading them to revise and reinterpret Christian doctrine and practice. And whenever a general assembly or synod has approved some departure from historic, the, the historic understanding of the church, the cry goes up, the Holy Spirit has spoken, the Holy Spirit has spoken. Friends, that is nothing short of blasphemy. Acts chapter 15 gives us an excellent example of how the church should resolve doctrinal controversies. Acts chapter 15, it's about whether or not the Gentiles, the non-Jews, could be accepted within the church without, first of all, converting to Judaism and uh, being circumcised. Uh, some claimed that only Jews were the people of God and therefore uh, Gentiles had to convert to Judaism. Uh, others, like Paul and Barnabas, argued that it is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that Jew and Gentile are included within the family of God. So a council was called in Jerusalem and the church listened to the arguments 
And the final decision was announced by James. Acts chapter 15, verses 13 to 15. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. And he goes on to say Amos chapter 9, though he could have cited and maybe did cite several other Old Testament texts. So the point is this, that in resolving this dispute, they went to the scriptures. They went to the scriptures. Um, it's so important. The Holy Spirit will never say anything that is incompatible with the Bible, because after all, he is the ultimate author of the Bible. So there we have the first chapter of the Confession of Faith. Next time we're going to move on to chapter 2, which deals with what we believe about God himself. Thank you for being part of this study and I hope you find it helpful.